And so I teach about maybe a hundred students per quarter. Um, I'll get like maybe 10% of them in, in a quarter, really like one or two who really, really let me know that they're, that they really appreciate um, how I've set up the classes and everything. Right. So I'm assuming that is true for all these other students, for the 90 of them who don't tell me. Um, you know, because like students generally just don't say anything. Yeah. Um, um, it's not that they're apathetic. It's just that they don't, they don't feel, I don't know, they don't feel, I don't, well, there, there's various reasons, right? Like you could feel not agentive or you could feel like it doesn't matter or you could feel like... <laughs> whatever right um, um but my course evaluations have been have been good and um there's a reflection that each student has to do at the end of the quarter and you know those have been good, pretty good um um but then yeah every quarter i have like maybe two letters from students who um who get it who like really thank me because they they totally get it they're like i understand now i understand that um you know, um, being supportive of people is is why we're here and things like that, right? Um, so, I, you know, I teach in this design program. And so one of the letters I got this year was from this design student who's like, I get it now. I get I get the whole, you have to like empathize with, your, with, with other people in order to be able to design for them. And I understand that step of the process better now because, um, you know, because I apparently I opened their eyes in terms of like considering uh, the position, I guess, of other people um, and not just focusing on your own thing. I've been thinking about one of the, in terms of students' response, responses to my unit, one of the, I think, most exciting responses that I've seen is when students um, who are prompted to practice mindful listening. So kind of being present with other people, being more empathetic, being curious, that type of thing um, was seen when they would describe doing that like in their workplace, for instance. So a lot of uh, my students are healthcare workers. So hearing about how they were interacting in a more mindful way with um, people who were going through really difficult times um, but also how it, how they got a reward from that, you know, a reward, that there's a reward from um, being empathetic so that it's not, which I think helps reinforce the idea that our happiness is always interconnected with other people's happiness too. So it's, um, I think really heartening. It was, it's been really heartening, I think, like seeing those responses. Absolutely. It's like the, the, the quickest way to happiness is to attend to the happiness of others, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when you, when you, you know, I guess you, you, when you first started teaching, you already basically added that unit in, right? Um, has it changed over the last two years? Yeah, so I ended up actually uh, doing a conference presentation where I kind of reflected on um, how I realized, and partly I think it was a result of realizing or kind of like remembering the things I'd written about with my dissertation about the interconnectedness of, you know, um, others people's happiness with your own happiness. I realized that even the term like self-management doesn't, um, doesn't kind of encourage a mindset of thinking about you know, attending to your own emotions, attention, awareness, things like that um, in a more holistic way. So I think um, that on top of, again, thinking about the realities of everything that was happening in the world and how we need to attend to those, like you can't, you know, I, I guess um, there's a lot out there with mindfulness where um there's the term of like neoliberal mindfulness where it's um, or neoliberal self-care where it's like, you know, positive vibes only is, is the one that I see a lot. Um, or even uh, one of my students came up with uh, at the end of the semester, one of the semesters was like, oh, I found this really great meditation. And the meditation was like, 
um, had sayings in it. It wasn't really all, even much of a meditation versus like, um, I imagine myself as wealthy and I imagine myself as this. And it was like, you know, that kind of um, more individualistic version of self-care where it's like, um, it it treats even uncomfortable emotions that I think we should be feeling in response to things that are happening around the world as like things to avoid or distract yourself. So it's like, you have to be very, very careful of how you frame mindfulness as well as which um, which version of mindfulness you're going to kind of <laughs> adopt. So I think there are some um, versions of my like mindfulness out there that are very again individualistic and um, not not concerned with social justice issues, violence, things like that. So so I think I've um, I realize how how much more I need to be intentional about not only like not presenting that type of mindfulness, but also, which I think I've always tried to do, but also literally calling up and, and kind of pointing out to people, hey, there are these other versions of mindfulness that you're going to come across. So if you didn't like the mindfulness exercises that I've offered and you kind of go exploring on your own, you almost need to be to practice a type of literacy with that to understand like how these types of mindfulness are they're not supportive of a type of wellness that is holistic and is caring and based in kindness um kindness and compassion for other people so I think I, I kind of mirror that a little bit in the, in the last couple of years that the design courses I've been teaching have been more and more about, I guess, like designing for social justice type of ideas. Um, although it's probably too subtle, like it's probably like they are things I believe in, but I don't think I've been explicit enough in um getting my students to think specifically about how do you how do you um you know design for marginalized groups or or for accessibility or something like that um or for like uh fighting oppressive systems or whatever right um and i think this past year or this summer, I mean, it's only been a month or so <laughs> for summer, but I've done a lot of sort of thinking already and talking to other colleagues and everything. And I think next year it's gonna be the, the, the stuff that I teach that I'm gonna cover in my design courses are gonna be much more explicit in terms of how do you design for mm. um, people who, who don't have um, the power to um, you know, express themselves or have their voices heard and everything, right? How, how do you make sure, how do you design for their voices? Yeah, it's just something, it's weird. Cause like, I feel like in, in academia, if you're not like in a school that's about like, mm. you know, multicultural education or like, uh, or like, you know, um, critical race, theory or something like that or whatever right you're not you're not explicitly in one of those labels yeah, yeah. right then it's hard to find space for that I think mm -hmm. in some disciplines because like like let's you know um because you're just in charge of teaching a particular discipline or a professional discipline right, <laughs> right. like yeah. I just need yeah. to cover like okay this you know this is how you make a uh a mock-up of a web app, right? right. It's yeah, not yeah. like um, they are inherently uh, about like social justice things, right? But yeah. the more I sort of have been teaching, the more I realize that's not true. Like we should be injecting these things into everything. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if we as people really believe these things, then we should try to get the, our beliefs into our curriculum more um, so that at the end of the day, you feel good about yourself because the way 
you know, <laughs> uh, to be an educator means not just to pass knowledge on, but also to pass values on, um, I feel like. And we have opinions, you know, about like, these are, these are the values we should be having as a society, as a democratic society and everything. Um, and so um, I think we have a duty to try to pass those values on. You know, and, it's, and there's this tension in, 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 in U.S. schools, at least, where, like, that's sort of downplayed because, you know, universities are more and more about, like, trade schools, about, like, you know, we're just training people to go off and work at Amazon after they graduate, right? Um, mm -hmm. Instead of, like, no, that's not, that's not what we should be concentrating on. We should be concentrating on, like, let's make sure these are whole people right. by the time they graduate. Yeah. So, then, so then they can be participants in our in in making the world better in in terms of how we govern ourselves and all this stuff and um you can't do that if you only focus on you know math problems or whatever right Have yeah math problems for something because like the purpose of a liberal education you know it's it's to um i i kind of see it as like a way of um, there's a a thing in rhetoric and writing a pop, uh, that was written in 2011 um, that talks about habits of mind. And it was written by like the writing um, program and administration where it talks about things like um, curiosity, openness, um, things like metacognition, that type of thing. Um, and I think that it's partly learning, it's encouraging students to have those habits where they it's a way of responding and, and thinking about the world as well as um, the content that needs to come along with that, which I think happens over a lot of courses, which is getting exposure to different viewpoints, diverse scholars, like diverse readings, that type of thing. But I, I think too, when I think about what have I changed and what do I want to change? Um, I think that I was thinking about like, especially this recently I've been revising uh, revising my course in terms of its learning objectives and I thought have those learning objectives could could some of those be reframed to also incorporate the things that we're talking about here as well as like diversity and um, things like decolonialism anti-racism anti-racism that type of thing um, as well as I'm always trying to think about stories like what stories are they exposed to as well but but also like you said audiences like who are they I I have a in that same professional writing skills class I have a unit on redesigning a website well I really I realized after you said that that I could do something very similar where it's like be more intentional about who your audiences are and seeking out audiences that you don't typically think about and but to do that, you also have to be empathetic. So it's like you have to teach these things at the same time. Yeah. That that makes me think of like in in my classes um, during the Zoom era, uh, <laughs> I would start each class basically asking, like we would just do check-ins, right? So this is it's a little bit different because it's not like mindfulness or meditation or anything like that, but it's more like um, just like hey, how did how was your week? Is there anything you want anyone wants to talk about before I start recording? Um, mm. That's a good idea. And like for a couple of quarters or a couple of classes, it worked really well. And there are some students who are. Um, willing to share or just talk about stuff and you know for some of them it's just like we just talk about whatever like we watched a cool movie or whatever right um but there are a couple of times when like a student would really like take the time to just like share something super vulnerable I feel like um and I'm kind of amazed when that happened because like what would compel a student to share that um you know and be vulnerable and in all the other classes um that didn't happen and i think it didn't doesn't happen because why would you open up to a whole bunch of strangers right so it's hit or miss right i guess is what i'm saying but i've been thinking about that and thinking about how how can i make it more hit than miss <laughs> or how yeah. can i make it you know how can i make it more like 
seen as a as an opportunity for students to take advantage of i guess um but i haven't really pushed it or anything because i or or explored like other things i could be doing because part of me is also like well they know it's there and if they ever need it then they can do something but they don't have to right and maybe none of the students in this particular class need need that space right so i just haven't really um done anything with it <laughs> other than just say hey does anyone want to talk about anything yeah um, but like maybe i should be a little bit more intentional maybe i should be more like you know incorporate it more explicitly with like the things that i'm trying to do with like good teamwork and frame things like okay one of the things that I think is going to make our society better, our world better is if we have more people caring about each other. And so what I'm going to do at the beginning of every class is set aside at least five minutes where we, you know, just take a moment and like calm down and like just reflect on the past week and share anything that you want, right? Like maybe I need to frame it that way to make it much more of an expli explicit, like this is, we are doing this deliberately. Um, um, you know, and, and then hearing about what you do is making me think that maybe I should do this, <laughs> you know? I, I think it's interesting because I, I have a friend who we kind of talked about how to, improve our both of our listening skills um and I was trying to explain that like sometimes you just have to be keep being curious when you're in a conversation with someone but that it's you have to kind of keep going with the flow and how that doesn't feel comfortable at first and it's kind of a little bit like you know um it can be scary almost but also it takes it takes practice I think and so I'm kind of thinking about how can I, how can I create exercises for students to practice being in that mode of being the curious one, like almost like an interviewing someone, you know, but you're, you're kind of uh, exercising your curiosity of what they're saying is to kind of keep the conversation going. And I wondered, I'm wondering what that might be like for students to practice that. I don't know if it would make them super, I know, I know some of them are probably super anxious to do that, but at the same time, I think it's a really, really important, listening in general is a really, really important skill. Um, and I think one that we can practice in the writing classroom 